All right, we're going to be looking at a, a kind of a subject in the first few verses of chapter 25, and that's uh, the topic of being a king, a king. You know, the Bible says there in Revelation chapter 1 uh, that God has made us kings and priests unto his father. Jesus has. And one of these days, we we're, we're, are uh, apt to be or possibly be a king that helps in the ruling of this world in that thousand-year millennial reign. And so we are royalty in that way. We're a, the uh, Bible says, a royal priesthood and um, in that lineage of the king. So uh, we should know a little bit about being a king. And uh, I think we covered this one time before, uh, but we're going to look into it today again. I want to read the first few verses, first of all. In chapter 25, verse 1, the Bible says, These are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of uh, Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. The heaven for heights and the earth for depth and the heart of kings is unsearchable. Take away the dross from the silver and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. Take away the wicked from before the king, and his throne shall be established in a righteousness. Put not forth thyself in the presence of the king, and stand not in the place of great men, for it is better that... Uh, it be said unto thee, Come up hither, then thou shouldest uh, be put lower in the presence of the prince whose, uh, whose thine eyes have seen. Uh, we're going to stop right there. And a few things right here in these verses talking about uh, it's the glory of God. God, a lot of times, hides things in the Bible. He doesn't make things uh, so easy to uh, search out when you're looking into the Bible for an answer. I believe the Bible has the answer of all, all things and all questions that we might have as uh, human beings here in this earth, and God can give us the answer right as uh, uh, we search for him in Proverbs chapter 2. In uh, verse 1, my son, if thou receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seek her as silver and searchest for her as hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. God wants us uh, to approach his word uh, to find the answers of everything and every question we might have. And sometimes he doesn't just make the answer easy to find. I don't know how many of you have have studied the Bible that way, but that's how I began as I read through the Bible. I would uh, find a catchphrase, a phrase that caught my attention, and I was fortunate enough to have uh, uh, the type of uh, Bible that had the center index, and it followed that phrase through the Bible. And you go from one place to another, and the book of Isaiah says, uh, who are those that are, are, are mature? And he said, it's those that are drawn from away from the milk and, uh, and uh, learned it to uh, eat meat. It says, uh, for precept must be upon precept. Hear a little 
and their little. And he repeats it. The precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. And that's how God wants us to study. In Timothy, he says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so God helps us in the study, but he makes it and makes us search for it, to search for it. And that's to make it more important in our mind and heart uh, to find the answer. When we find the answer, it's a lot more satisfying if you had to work a little bit to get it, is what God is saying. And he purposely has written the Bible that way. I'm glad we have a book that's without error. I'm glad of that. I'm glad we have a, a perfected book, the Bible says. In Psalms 12, he said, For the words of the Lord are pure, pure words tried in the furnace of the earth and tried seven times. There's seven different ways that God has purified uh, the Bible to give us a completed and preserved and perfected Bible. And most people don't see it that way, but the truth of the matter is that uh, the Bible perfected our English language. Those first three colleges, three colleges, Oxford, Chamber, uh, Cambridge, Cambridge and one other, I forget it, that, and about 12 different scholars in each college, they all translated the Bible, their part, and then they passed it from one to another, and then they passed it to the next college, went through all of that. And there was a couple of hundred new English words were formed out of translating the Bible. So much so that uh, Noah Webster says, now that we have a perfected translated Bible, now we need to give the people a complete dictionary that includes all the new words that the translators added to the English language. So the Bible perfected the language the language didn't perfect the Bible, but the Bible perfected our language. And that's why this Bible is so uh, precious and one of a kind and uh, such a uh, work of God to give us this Bible that is completed, compiled, uh, divided, and uh, perfected to us to study. And... Uh, Along with that, God gives the author, the Holy Spirit. That's what he tells us in Second Peter chapter 1, that it's not cunningly devised fables, but holy men of God, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, wrote down the words of the Bible. In fact, some of them had no idea what they were talking about when they wrote it down. They simply just wrote down what God told them uh, to write without really understanding it. If you've ever read Isaiah and Ezekiel and some of Jeremiah, you know that they did not understand what God was doing. Yet God took all these, these volumes of books and he put them together the way he wanted it to go so that we could search the Bible and go from one place to another place, to another place, to another place. And each time we, we get a little deeper and a little more understanding and it becomes something that really enriches our lives that, so that uh, there's no doubting God intended us to get this precept that he was presenting to us out of the word. So it's a wonderful, wonderful book uh, that God has given us. And it's also a wonderful thing to uh, have the ability God has given us through the Holy Spirit, the author of the book, to guide us through the Bible and help us to find that. 
and I've experienced it. I don't know if you have. I've experienced it several times, especially early in my uh, uh, Christian uh, walk, uh, that God would bring something to remembrance that wasn't even in the references, and I would go to that, and that would remind me of something else, and God just kept bringing thoughts to my mind uh, for me to follow and find uh, the answer I was looking for. And it's a, a very satisfying uh, endeavor when you search for the answer or the precept that you're looking for to confirm it, to know without a shadow of a doubt that's exactly what God wanted us to get out of that uh, precept by studying precept upon precept here and there and, and throughout the whole Bible so that we could come to a very uh, confident conclusion of the whole matter. And that's how God teaches us. He takes the Bible and gives us the Holy Spirit and then tells us to search for the answer. And he helps us to find it because he guides us to it. And uh, I can't say enough about how much that mean, has meant to me and means to me even today as we study things in, in the Bible. But then I want us to think today about what does it mean to be a king? You and I may be uh, have that bestowed upon us when it comes to the thousand year millennial reign. I never thought about being president, but uh, but we may be in, in that kind of position uh, when it comes to uh, reigning with the Lord through that thousand year. He, he says uh, uh, in the New Testament, in the the Sermon on the Mount in, I think, two different Gospels. He that is faithful in little, I'll make him ruler over ten cities. So, there is a reward in that. I would much rather be a king than a servant. I don't know about you, I'd rather be the one giving the orders than the one taking the orders. But uh, he's... He's really looking for those that have served him with humility and grace uh, in the time we have here. Uh, one thing I'll, I'll say before we move on, uh, I want to go to Deuteronomy chapter 17 here in a second. One thing to kind of put it in per, uh, today's perspective is verse 5, Take away the wicked from before the king and his throne, shall be in established in righteousness. I wish uh, Washington, D.C. could follow that example. And I, I do pray for our president. I, I pray that God might, through his power and his spirit, put some better people around our president to give him a lot better advice than the stuff he's been getting and the things he have been, has been doing, because it is sure wrecking our nation, his policies and the things that he has promoted in our nation has really damaged our nation. And most of that is because God said if, if the advisors and the counselors around the king are wicked, they're going to give him bad advice. And I think all of us are pretty well convinced that uh, our President uh, Biden is not doing things in his own volition or his own uh, willpower or knowledge. He's doing what somebody else is telling him to do. And uh, that's a sad thing in itself, but that's the way it is. So uh, pray for our nation. And pray for those that are in authority is what the Bible says, that we could live a, a more peaceable uh, life. All right, turn over to Deuteronomy now in uh, chapter 17. Uh, I want to begin reading here in verse 14 <clears throat> of that chapter. 
I'll give you time for the pages. I love to hear the pages of the Bible turning. It's always a satisfying. Chapter 17, Deuteronomy 17, verse 14. <clears throat> the Bible says, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me like as all the nations that are about me. Thou shalt uh, in any wise set him king over thee, whom, whom uh, the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother, but he shall uh, not multiply horses to himself, nor cause people to return to Egypt to the, uh, to the end that he should multiply horses, for as much as the Lord has said unto you, ye shall henceforth uh, return no more that way, neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold, and it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests and Levites, and it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to uh, keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, that he turn not aside from uh, the commandment uh, to the right hand or to the left, but uh, to the end that he may prolong his days and his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So God gave a commandment about a king. In fact, he pretty much tells them, I know one day in, when you enter into the promised land, you get all settled in that you're going to ask for a king like all the other nations. Now, if you remember in the book of 1 Samuel, uh, no, 2 Samuel, I believe. 2 Samuel, when, when the people cried out for a king, Samuel was very angry at the people because uh, he told the people, why do you want a man to rule over you when right now God is your king? God is your king. Because they were working... Uh, in a theocracy at that time. In other words, the, the religious leaders were also the leaders of the nation. And God would raise up a judge or a prophet uh, to lead the nation through uh, the Spirit of God enabling a man to speak on God's behalf. And uh, for years and years and years until I got studying the book of Proverbs here this, this year when I was studying and I, I found this uh, verse in Deuteronomy, I always thought, well, uh, they were disobeying God and God didn't expect them to have a king and, and uh, that's where the, the whole nation went wrong when really... In the book of Deuteronomy, God already made a provision when they do get a king, this is how your king should be chosen and this is what your king should be like. He already gave a, a outline to the people of how to judge a king when you make a king in your nation. So God already expected one day for them to have a king over them because that was going to be the, the course of uh, 
culture as the nation grew into more of a theocracy and a more of a uh, stronger nation among the nations, they would want a king. So God made a provision for it all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy, which is one of the books that uh, Moses wrote, which is part of the books of the law, the Pentateuch that Moses had written. So God gave an outline to them. Uh, he can't be a stranger, and he, got, uh, he has to be one of your brethren, and he needs to uh, be a godly person, and when he is made king, the first thing that he should do is write out and copy out his own copy of the laws of God. And he was to keep that book with him that was in his own handwriting with him and read it every day so that he would learn what the laws of God are and how to guide the nation uh, under the outline of the books of the law. The law that God gave Moses to give to the nation of Israel, and that was how he was to guide the nation. Of course, we know that the first uh, king that they chose for themselves was the choice of the people. Why did he choose Saul? Uh, in this room, we would choose who? <laughs> we'd choose, we'd, <laughs> we'd, we'd take... Don, because he's so much taller. It, it said that 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 uh, uh, Saul was head and shoulders taller than anybody else in Israel. So he was a very tall man. He was his dad was a prominent uh, uh, shepherd or herder and uh, had many different lands. And he was very much a valiant fighter. Usually in uh, other nations that they lived around and amongst in the, in the land they were living at, they, were, uh, they would choose the warrior that was the best warrior and the strongest warrior. He was a leader among men. That men would follow him and when he... Uh, won all the battles and led them to victory. And uh, he was a man that they could follow as a leader that uh, some people just issue uh, confidence, don't they? You have confidence in them as uh, a leader and uh, follow them because of their leadership and their ability as a warrior and that started a kingship in that nation and that family would keep that kingship until uh, somebody else rose up or something happened that would change all that around <clears throat> and uh, with the nation of Israel uh, God said and took away that kingdom because God still controls the lives and kingdoms. He'll say, I'll, I'll lift up who I'll lift up and I'll put down who I'll put down. He said of Nebuchadnezzar, this is Nebuchadnezzar, my servant. He will uh, help and uh, really empower one individual to rise up to be a leader among the people. And in Saul's case, Saul, uh, Saul uh, proved to be a unpredictable leader and the wrong man for the, for the job because he would not obey God. God said, go kill all the Amalekites. And what does he do? He saves the king of the Amalekites. He saves the best of the the flock of, uh, of them. And uh, when uh, 
Samuel met him. He said, what is this I hear? Did you kill all of them? Did you kill all the animals and leave all that stuff for the Lord? Well, what's the bleeding of the sheep I hear? And then the next time that we read about uh, Saul, he decided that Samuel was uh, taking too much time to get there because he wanted to have a, a sacrifice and honor God with the sacrifice before they went out to battle. And Samuel was supposed to be there at a certain time, and he was already four days past that time. So Saul said, well, we don't have to wait on Samuel. I'll step forward and I'll do the sacrifice, and that would be good. He lifted himself up into a position above his authority because then he was putting himself in the authority of God above uh, even Samuel. And uh, God said, for that reason, I'm taking the kingdom from you. I'm going to change it. And I'm going to choose a king for myself. And God chose then David, as we all know, as uh, the king. So God doesn't look on the outward appearance of man, because David wasn't bigger or stronger or mightier than Saul, but he had a, had a right heart. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. That's the most important thing with God is what's on the inside, what's, what's uh, motivating us uh, to do the things that we do. Is our motive right? And uh, I know preacher says this more than once. We're going to all be judged at the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ not for condemnation, whether we get tossed into hell or not, but for rewards. How many rewards, crowns, did we win? And uh, preacher always emphasizes what sort of work we did. It's our motivation. It's the same way with two men built two houses. You look at them sitting there side by side. They look just like these houses we have in Florida where they're all the same, you know. What do they call them? My wife calls them cookie cutter houses. But they look the same. But God said, but this man built his, his uh, house on the sand. Now that's how they build it in Florida anymore monolithic poor. The foundation and the floor and everything's one poor. I hate that. We used to dig down two, two or three feet and lay a foundation into the dirt and then build up a wall above the dirt and then we'd fill it and then we'd pull the floor on top of that to hold it all together. And he says the other man built his house on a rock. You can't dig far enough to get rock in Florida, but you can go down a little ways. But he said this man built his house on the sand, and that house didn't stand during the storms. This man built his house on a rock, and it, it withstood the storm because they built them on different ideas, different principles. We want to build our lives on the rock. And the rock that followed them in the wilderness, uh, 1 Corinthians 10 says, that rock was Christ. So our rock, our solid rock, is Jesus Christ. And that's no... No foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ. That's our foundation. When you get saved, you lay a foundation. And you got the right foundation that's built on the rock. But how you build after that is up to you and me. We can build it cheap, or we can build it a weak, or we can build it strong, and take the time to reinforce that and do it the right way. 
And that's what he's going to look at, why we did what we did. We may, uh, several different preachers preach on the street or pastor a church or or be in evangelism, but it's why are they doing it? Are they doing it to make a big name for themselves? Or are they doing it with a genuine desire to see people saved and, and uh, to, to uh, uh, disciple people in the right way to walk? Are they doing it for the right reasons? Or are they doing it just to make themselves big? And there's a lot of uh, ministers in this world today that are building their own kingdom financially and they're not really looking out and then he says that he shouldn't have uh, much much money don't do it for monetary gain and don't do it for power and uh, adm- admiration as it says in the book of Jude about those that speak great swelling words having men's admiration but we do it for the right reasons in the right way. And he tells us through the book of Proverbs how uh, that should be and how a king should be and what he should be like. And uh, I, would, I, I had all of them written down, but we don't need to study all that. I'm just laying the foundation this morning about kingship. Are you fit to be a king? Do you have the right motivation? Do you have a pure heart? Are you doing the right things for the right reason? Because God's looking at what little things we may do now to decide how big a thing that we might do in the millennial kingdom of God. So you ask the question, am I fit to be a king? Not in man's eyes. They look on the outward things, but on the inward parts. That's what God's looking at. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your love, mercy, and grace. Thank you for uh, promising to make us kings and priests and that we may rule with you in uh, that millennial kingdom. We do look forward to that. And and more than that, we pray that you would help us uh, to find those souls that are still looking and still able to be saved in this world and help us to uh, find them and help us to help uh, bring them into your kingdom and your family. Go with us in the rest of the services today and bless, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Nobody loves me like you love me. I stand in awe of your amazing way. I worship you as long as I am breathing. God, you are faithful.